I'm Craig Stocks, and the uh, what I've got going on out here in Utah is a, a remote observatory by the name of Utah Desert Remote Observatories, and you can check the website online at utahdesertremote.com, and there's uh, quite a bit more information there. Uh, I'm I'm trying to not make this a sales pitch, but I'm going to talk about remote imaging and uh, how remote observatories work. So hopefully, even if you're not an astrophotographer, it's still kind of interesting information just to see how the pieces fit together, because it is a lot different from sitting next to the telescope. And I like to think of it as kind of remote astrophotography or even robotic astrophotography. Uh, some of the some of the benefits are pretty obvious that if you live in a city or someplace with uh, very you know inclement weather, uh, getting someplace to a darker sky with more clear nights is uh, a pretty obvious benefit. The other benefit that I don't think I fully appreciated starting out is that it separates you from the telescope. And I realize for some people that's a big negative. <clears throat> but if your goal is to do as much imaging as you can, it turns out to be a very big positive. Because while the telescope is out doing its thing, you can be asleep or at a dinner party or presenting to an astronomy club or doing any number of things that uh, that life demands of you and just let the uh, the telescope in the observatory take care of things for you. So I I literally do most of my imaging while I'm asleep. I realize it's not for everybody. I mean, for a lot of people, a night under the stars with their telescope is is the whole reason they're in the in the hobby, and and I understand that, uh, but it is a good solution for some people. Uh, if you, like we talked about earlier, if you live someplace that has inclement weather or uh, a lot of light pollution, or if you have a job or some other travel requirements that takes you away from home. Uh, then remote becomes a viable option and maybe the the only way or the best way for you to really enjoy the hobby and lastly it is expensive uh, generally if you're looking at a hosted observatory you're looking at several hundred dollars a month and up so it's it's not cheap the typical architecture if you imagine a telescope that's configured uh, so that you can sit next to it and operate it uh, connected to a laptop or some kind of a computer uh, that's kind of the starting point, uh, and if you can imagine, you've got a, a computer attached to that remote telescope, so I'll call that the remote PC, and you're sitting at home, and you have your home PC, and through the magic of the internet, you're able to connect those two computers using a remote desktop application, so that basically your home computer becomes the monitor, keyboard, and mouse for controlling the remote computer. And then all of the work is actually done on the remote computer. So at a very high level, that's the way it works. The remote location could be in your backyard. Uh, you know, if you're the type who is, is traveling, you might have a observatory in your backyard and access it remotely from a motel room on the other side of the country. Uh, or you could be just the opposite. You might be at home and have your telescope in a remote observatory a thousand miles away. Basically, for the location, you need a secure site uh, that you don't have to worry about. You need power and you need high speed Internet. And those are really the, the three main things that you need. The equipment is pretty basic. Uh, if you're an astrophotographer, most of this, I'm sure, is going to look familiar to you. You need an optical tube assembly or OTA something that you know to look through you need a camera you need a computer you need a mount to hold all that <clears throat> uh, you need an automatic focuser because you're not going to be next to it to actually turn the knob a filter wheel is real nice to have uh, because again you're not going to be there to insert filters with a filter drawer and a rotator is a very nice feature to have because then you can you can change the framing and the orientation of the camera to frame the, the targets in the best way possible. So just talking about each one of those for the optical tube assembly, you know, pretty much any OTA will work. There's, there's no real special requirements. It could be a longer, short focal length. Uh, it could be a, a, a digital SLR lens. The, the Rokinon 135s are real popular. What it does need is the ability to accept an autofocuser somehow. So if, you're, if your OTA can accept an autofocuser, 
it will probably work. For the camera, I would say you do need to consider a dedicated astro camera of some sort, uh, ideally one with cooling, but a, a digital SLR or mirrorless camera would probably not work well in a remote environment because of power switching on and off. There's just too many things that are designed to be physical switches on a, cam on a camera that just aren't feasible in a remote environment. So you're, you're really looking at a dedicated astronomy camera of some sort. You do need a computer. Uh, most people are going to use a Windows-based PC. Uh, the, the Prima Luce Labs Eagle or the Nooks are very popular and inexpensive. A laptop will work as long as you keep the lid closed so that it's not, you know, lasting out light. But pretty much any kind of a computer uh, that can handle the environment or be protected from the environment should work okay. Unfortunately, an ASI Air, at least as it's as it stands now, really isn't suitable for remote use. It it just doesn't have enough of the controls that you need to to really manage things remotely to to work well in a remote environment. I'm I'm sure somebody who's dedicated enough could figure out a way to make it work, but I don't think it would work nearly as well as a, a full computer. The mount is probably the most important piece, and the most important characteristic in the mount is that it has either a homing function or encoders. <clears throat> and that, that does ratchet it up the, the price range a little bit, not a, a whole lot to get to something with uh, homing functions. And, and even the new uh, ZWO harmonic drive mount does have a, a homing function. So it, it would be suitable, I believe, for remote use. Um, what the homing function does is if you reset the mount or if it loses power, uh, it can return to a home position based on encoders and then it's good to go. It doesn't have to be manually reset to a, a physical home position. It can it can find that home position by using an encoder. So that's kind of the, the minimum requirement for a mount to be, you know, easily used in a remote environment. I mentioned before, you do need the ability to put an autofocuser on the, on the telescope, uh, and that's pretty obvious why. Same way with a filter wheel, uh, and pretty much any focuser or filter wheel that I've seen is, is probably gonna work just fine as long as the filters and filter wheel are appropriate for the camera and you get the right back focus distance if you're using a, uh, a flattener, then you should be fine. A rotator is really nice to have. Uh, you can set up your, your sequences so that the camera is rotated to give you the best framing possible for each target. <clears throat> it does complicate flat frames because you know, depending on your system, if your system is completely symmetrical and the orientation doesn't matter for flat frames, then, then it's pretty easy. But if you have a system that is somewhat asymmetrical and you have to match the camera rotation for the flats, then flats get much more complicated because your flats have to match the camera rotation angle. That I'm fortunate on my systems, I can, I can use the flats in pretty much any orientation. A flip flat is another nice thing to have, especially for the smaller refractor type telescopes. Um, it serves as both a dust cover and a flats panel. Although to be honest, I get better flats with sky flats than I do with the uh, flip flat. So even though one of the telescopes has a flip flat, I rarely use it. I almost always use sky flats. And if there's any questions along the way, just chime in. Some additional equipment that uh, you would consider the first one is a remote power switch. Uh, this is basically an outlet strip on steroids that will connect to the internet. And what that lets you do is you can connect uh, over the internet just using a browser. You can connect to this switch and you can turn those individual outlets off and on. So if you need to reset your mount, reset a camera, if you want to turn things off during the day and turn them back on at night before you start imaging, you can do all that remotely uh, using this remote power switch. And the digital loggers is seems to be by far the most commonly used remote power switch, and they run 180 to 200 dollars, something like that. So not in the grand scheme of things, not terrible. 
If you're going to have multiple Ethernet connections, you may want an unmanaged Ethernet switch. You can get these for like $15. It's basically like a splitter for Ethernet so that you can plug one in and have four coming out. So you can connect both your computer and your um, remote power switch to an Ethernet cable. And then lastly, it's nice to have a little UPS battery backup so that if there's a, a, a quick glitch in the uh, power, <clears throat> it can keep everything running so that you don't have to restart. Now, if you're doing it yourself rather than in a hosted observatory, these are some of the other things that you would need to provide, starting with a concrete foundation for your telescope and obviously a physical observatory enclosure. A reliable power and even consider an automatic backup generator just in case the power does go out for an extended period of time. High speed internet. Uh, generally, we're creating lots of really big files, so having high speed internet becomes very critical. Uh, you need an observatory control computer separate from your imaging computer to take care of opening and closing the roof, monitoring the weather systems, and so forth. Uh, and then you need the local area network to tie all these things together for shared data. You need a physical roof opener of some sort to physically open and close the roof. And then the roof controller hardware and software to control that roof opener. Uh, weather monitoring system. And ideally that's integrated with the roof controller so that it automatically knows when it can open and close the roof. And if the weather changes, it'll automatically close it. Equipment for monitoring, uh, you know, such as the you know, web cameras uh, to be able to physically see the, the state of the observatory and the telescope and the cameras. An all sky camera is nice to have so that you can, you know, especially if you're working remotely, so you can see what the sky looks like. Uh, sky quality measure, meter is kind of a nice to have, but it measures the sky darkness. Uh, not really critical to your night to night operation. A seeing monitor uh, is very nice to have because that way you can correlate problems that you might be having with guiding with the current seeing conditions at the site. And then lastly, some sort of hands on support. Uh, you know, if you're 100 or 1000 miles away, having somebody who can physically go out and reset a USB cable or flip a switch or, you know, any number of things that you might need having physical hands on site becomes a really important thing to have in some situations. And, you know, those are just all reasons why people might choose an already established hosting facility. To talk a little bit more about the control architecture, I mentioned earlier that basically we have a remote PC and then you're working at your home PC and it becomes the monitor keyboard and mouse. So the way that really works in a little bit more detail, if we look at that remote PC, to start with, you would have all of the software on that computer that you would normally need to control your, your telescope if you were sitting next to it. So some kind of a mount controller software, camera controller, filter wheel, wheel control, auto guider software, focuser, uh, rotator controller, auto flat controller. So all those different pieces would be loaded on that computer and connected to those pieces of hardware, typically through a USB hub of some sort. And these days, most of that gets integrated either through or with an ASCOM platform so that some of these devices can talk to each other. And then above that, it's nice to have, and you can get by incidentally even without the ASCOM platform, you can sit next to the computer or a thousand miles away, do all these steps manually, point the telescope, trigger the camera, move the filters. You can do all that mechanically just fine. The real power comes when you have some sort of a session manager. And that what the session manager does is typically through the ASCOM platform, it can control all these different pieces along with a shooting plan to, to collect the information or the data for you. In my case, what I'm using, the session manager is a program called Voyager. Uh, there's also Nina and SGP and a few others, but basically what it lets you do is like you can do with the plan in an ASI Air, it lets you lay out the sequence of images that you want to do, what target, 
how long do you want the subs, what filter, where do you want to store the files, and so forth. So Voyager handles all of that. Uh, through the ASCOM platform, for the most part, it interfaces with the SkyX, which is controlling the mounts. Uh, I use, I've got Paramount mounts, so I'm using the SkyX to control the mount. I'm using an ASI camera driver for an ASI cameras. Uh, the filter wheels generally through an ASCOM. It's a ZWO filter wheel. I'm using PHD2 for auto guiding. Uh, I have an ASCOM compatible focuser, an ASCOM compatible rotator from Pegasus, and then an Alnatec flip flat. And Voyager can can control all of those things. It knows how to open and close the flat, rotate the camera, and so forth. The last piece we need to add to the remote PC then is some sort of a remote desktop application. And the first one I tried didn't work for me. The second one I tried was Google Remote Desktop, and I haven't had any trouble with it or any reason to try anything else. So I'm kind of stuck on using Google Remote Desktop. And it, it's tied to my Google account. So if I'm logged into the computer, uh, then it's active and I can connect from another computer that I'm also logged into Google. So Google Remote Desktop is how I communicate over the internet. And that will work with a, a computer, a tablet, a phone, uh, you know, pretty much any device. On my home computer, then, I have Google Remote Desktop app installed. And you can also run it just through Chrome, but it, it works a little bit more robustly if you have the, the app installed. And then from that Google Remote Desktop on my home computer, over the internet, I connect to the Google Remote Desktop on the remote computer, and then that gives me access to Voyager, which then controls everything, and I'm off to the races. In, within Voyager, I use a tool called DragScript, which basically you, you drag steps into a, a script or into a sequence of things that you want it to do. And it looks more complicated than it is that basically what this says is connect all the equipment when you start the script, wait till it's almost dark, run a calibration on the guiding system, wait for astronomical dark, and then start sequence one. And if there's an error, send me an email, otherwise complete sequence one, then go to sequence two. Again, if there's an error, send me an email, otherwise complete sequence two, and go on to sequence three and so forth. At the end of the sequences or at the end of the night, park the telescope, disconnect all the equipment and shut down. And that all happens incidentally, uh, the way I'm configured independently from controlling the roof. I have a separate system that opens and closes the roof. So there, there is a uh, kind of an air handling system built into Voyager that reads the roof status. If the roof is closed, it basically goes into a suspend mode and then if the roof opens, it restarts the script wherever it left off. So the roof might close for an hour in the middle of the night because of clouds moving in, and Voyager will simply suspend the sequence, and then if the roof reopens, it'll restart where it left off. If, that's, if it's in a sequence that's already finished its time slot, then it'll go to the next sequence and so forth. So all that happens kind of automatically while I'm sleeping. For file transfer, I just simply use Dropbox. I have a shared folder on the remote computer that's shared with a uh, folder on my home computer. And so as the images are collected on the remote computer, Voyager saves those files into a Dropbox folder. And about 20 seconds later, they pop up on my home computer. So, you know, quite literally, when I get up in the morning, I have files waiting for me. So my typical workflows, I kind of watch the weather during the day. Uh, I'll configure the script, you know, sometime in the afternoon or the evening for what I want to image that night. Uh, there are people who even have that automated. But then the observatory opens and I launch the programs and go to bed. And then the, my robot works for me all night imaging in the sky. Uh, when I get up in the morning, all the images are in a Dropbox folder for me on my PC. So it's, it's pretty easy. In my experience, remote takes some getting used to that, you know, when you, 
you know, once you're not able to actually go out and, and touch the telescope and move something or look at something or look at the sky, uh, you, you have to learn how to rely on remote sensors and um, web cameras that have a view of the telescope and an all-sky camera and reading the data from the weather system. So it, it takes a little getting used to. Um, and fortunately, we do have caretakers on site who, if something does go wrong, they can fix it. And my experience working remote, I get more data and better data. Uh, the more data is pretty obvious because of the dark sky. Uh, also, more imaging nights because it's uh, we have good weather patterns, and I'm typically able to image 65 to 85 percent of the nights each month. Uh, not always 100 percent of the night, but at least part of the night. Uh, but most importantly, and the thing I didn't really appreciate early on, is I don't have to be present. Uh, I can start it and then watch a movie with my wife or, you know, go out to dinner or do something else, and the computer is taking care of things for me. So that's kind of remote imaging in a nutshell, how the pieces work together. Uh, are there any questions? Many. <laughs> um, I, I, let me, I'll start. I currently do most of what you describe in my backyard, and I'm okay. very, very frustrated with um, light pollution, so I keep considering remote imaging. So I'm, I've been particularly aware of how often I have to go physically intervene for some reason. Um, and it's not a good, it's not a pleasant result. Uh, it, for instance, I've just gone through a whole bunch of fiddling with tilt and, uh, you know, trying to get tilt and um, back focus right. Um, that's the kind of thing that strikes me if I made a change that would require me to do all of that again because of a of a change in the imaging train or something, I would just have to be there for. So, you know, you'd have to fly, you know, 3,000 miles or whatever it is from fly, never know where anything is from Florida. It's too long of a state, but it's a long <laughs> ways. Yeah, we're about, the observatory is about a three-hour drive from Las Vegas. So the, the easiest way people get here is fly into Las Vegas and then drive. Yeah, so, but, but how... But how yeah, not easy. Is it just that they, they reach a point where they stabilize their their setup and just don't change it? Is that is that what's really mostly going on? Or don't think, change it other than every couple of years where they want to take a trip? I think that's part of it. Um, you know, like the the tilt issue you're talking about. Uh, I've And again, I've been fortunate. Uh, I have never had a tilt issue. Uh, but I also don't have any um, field flatteners or reducers in my imaging train. So so I don't have to really deal with back focus. Um, but it seems like people just, you know, get everything nailed down and then leave it alone and it stays the way they left it. So, and I guess that's the second part of this. One of the things I enjoy is I have splurged and I have three different OTAs, you know, very mm -hmm. a wide one, a medium one, and a, you know, a long focal length SCT. Um, and I kind of swap around. I'll image for about a month with one and then a you know, new target. I'll you know, pick a different OTA. I may even get rid of the SCT because the, 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 big, the longer refractor may be long enough and good enough that it just replaces it. But I, I gather there's no, um, I gather if someone wants two OTAs, they, they buy two mounts and two cameras and everything else to go with it and put it on two pedestals. So I, I, I assume you don't encourage someone to try to get the remote hands to replace OTAs? We can. That, oh, okay. you know, if, that, you know, certainly I would, you know, I would prefer you had two, two locations and two mounts uh, and run them both all night, uh, which, you know, I'm, I'm kind of blessed. That's what I do. But, but yeah, we can swap mounts if you need to put a longer focal length on during galaxy season. And then a, uh, you know, the wide field as summer rolls around. What what happens to the other OTA? Do you do you have secure storage and such for people or? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. That was a. <laughs> yeah, we can handle that. 
Um, it's nice but, to hear your at least imaging during the summertime, Craig, because <laughs> we pretty much don't. We do have a, uh, a monsoon season here in Utah, um, but most nights it will clear up during the night. So like during June, July, August, uh, if I look back at my imaging, I was only imaging in the like 60 to 70 percent of the nights. And most of those were partial nights where maybe the, it didn't open until midnight. Yeah. But typically, you know, typically we have wind during the day and clouds may build, but generally at sunset, the clouds just kind of melt away and the wind dies down. Not, not always. The last, this last week, we've had kind of one storm after another rolling in off the Pacific. So the last two weeks have not been good times. Yeah, I was just looking at your weather, and it looks like you're 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 not going to image tonight, but maybe tomorrow night. Yeah, you know? usually, uh, like I say the it's not unusual to image partial nights. Um, let me see if I can pull this up real quick. This was my imaging in December, so this is the the thirty one days of December. The there were what seven nights where I imaged a hundred percent of the night, and then some nineties, eighties, seventies, fifties, even some down in the forty and uh, and twenty percent. And I call it a successful night if I was able to capture usable data. Though so I know there was one of these nights. It was probably might be this one. Uh, the forecast was it was going to be closed all night and. I got an email notice that the weather was clear and the observatory was going to open in 20 minutes, which is something else we do. We have a Discord server where we every day we publish what the outlook is for the night. And if you want, you can get on the email list. So when the system sends me emails letting me know what's going to happen, it'll forward to you automatically. Anyway, I got the notification that it was going to open in 20 minutes. So I, I real quick uh, logged in and started my uh, the systems going on both telescopes. It opened and stayed open for about an hour and a half or two hours, but that was long enough to get some uh, hydrogen, sulfur, and RGB data on the uh, the head of the Seagull Nebula. So I actually got a uh, a finished image out of that two hours. And I, I haven't seen the uh, the field flat uh, device, but you mentioned doing sky flats. Yeah, that basically in the you know during um, civil twilight or uh, nautical twilight, uh, depending on how long of exposures you're you're interested in, basically you point the computer at the blank part of the sky and do your flats that way. And, and don't have it tracking. So if you actually have a star, they'll streak and, and not show up. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't had too much trouble with that. And my systems are, are symmetrical enough that I don't worry about the rotation angle. Um, I basically just keep using flats until I start getting uh, dust bunnies. Have, I was going to say, what, how, you don't have dust that rotates? Well, the, the dust is generally on that, uh, the glass cover on the camera. So it rotates with oh. the camera. Oh, okay. That's yeah, of course. So the the camera and actually the filter wheel rotate with together. So even if there were a dust spot, which is unlikely, but from the filter that would rotate with the camera. Right. You're not going to see dust on the objective. No. Right. I wasn't wasn't thinking right. So what do you do for um? If you have one of those flip flaps, it acts as a dust cover. Yeah. If you don't, like it's a bigger OTA or an SCT where I don't even think they make them for SCTs, or at least I haven't seen them. How do you keep crud from building up, you know, just from being open all the time in the desert? Uh, I leave the, 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 that dust cover extended, the lens hood. Yeah. Uh, I leave that extended and it's parked kind of angled down. And that keeps dust from settling on the lens and also ensures that it's in a sun safe position for the times when the observatory is open during the day. And, and how you want to make sure your park position is not pointed anywhere the sun could be. How does your session manager 
find out that the dome is open, or dome is the wrong term, the roof is open. There's a, um, a status file on a shared drive on the local area network at the observatory. So what you do on your remote PC is you connect to that remote, that, that shared drive, uh, which I have mapped as the U drive. And then you just read that status file in Voyager. And the way Voyager is set up in its safety monitor configuration, you define a safety string or a safe string, which is you know the word it's gonna see when it's safe. So I just have open defined as the, uh, the safe condition. And, and you guys close the roof based or on clouds or based on rain or how do you? All of that. Um, there's parameters for clouds. If it becomes overcast, it clo it'll automatically close. Uh, if, the, if the sensor gets wet, it'll close. If the humidity gets too high, it will close. Or if the wind gets too high, it'll close. Okay. And then we actually have uh, two weather systems. So they're, uh, they're, gonna, they're not right now, but very soon they'll be connected. So one's a primary and one's a backup. And, so if and one you, goes bad, the second one will take over. And, and do you back up power in case all of this happens? We do. Yeah, so the power's yeah. out in the storm, the roof is open, it, it'll, it'll shut itself. Yeah, we've got a, an automatic backup generator. That it's not, it's not a uh, uninterruptible, so it takes 20, 30 seconds before it to, to come online and start running and producing power, and then it'll automatically switch over from the grid to the generator. And is there any chance you can get Elon Musk to dig one of those hyperloops to connect to Florida so we can run back and forth in a couple <laughs> hours? One of those really long pneumatic tubes would be nice. So you just right. hop in a carrier and take a nap for an hour or two and you'll be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and you've got uh, some um, some more info on uh, your, your build out? Yeah. Yeah, we can, okay. we can move ahead here and talk a little bit about how we went about building this beast. Um, hey, I recognize Blur Exterminator in that shot. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great tool. I'm a, I'm a big fan of all of Russ's uh, tools. So we, we basically have two business models. We have the, obviously the uh, the peer rental for remote operation, and then we also have two systems that we do by the hour imaging system rental, um, and that's more of a you know one on one, uh, hands on thing where we we get together over Zoom, talk about what you want to image and how you want to image it. Uh, we actually control the telescope though, so it's all done to your specification. You get the data, exclusive use of the data. Uh, but you don't actually control the telescope. Uh, obviously, it's all done over the internet. So we have customers from Australia, Italy, Northern Europe, um, Montana, California, all over. Uh, peer rental is renting by the month with a uh, one-year lease, and that's $800 a month. Uh, the observatory building it actually has 18 peers, but I don't think all 18 are going to be usable at any one time. But we provide all of the uh, the fundamentals, the concrete foundation, power, internet, roof, weather, and an on-site caretaker. Uh, my Our daughter and son-in-law live on the site, and they're kind of the, the full-time caretakers. And if you need a, a custom peer, we can manufacture one you know, to, to whatever height you need. And those are, are done what, with uh, the paramount plates. Yeah. What is the difference between, uh, what is the, uh, the, the distance between the piers? Just curious. They, they vary, but they're six to eight foot centers. Okay. So we, we can handle, we can handle fairly large systems. I, I know we've got a uh, 24 inch plane wave going in, but it is on a, uh, an alt as configuration so it doesn't have as big a footprint the uh we'll have gonna do on that what's that they're going to do imaging on that yeah well that he actually has i mean i i don't know if he's decided exactly what package or what cameras he's going to put on it but it'll have a splitter so he'll have 
two or three separate instruments on it, plus a piggyback scope. When the big um, ones do all as they they have rotators in them. Yeah. So, so how they don't, many, you don't get field rotation. How yeah. many empty piers do you have right now? Depends on how you count, but right now I would say one or two. Okay. Um, so availability could be an issue then? Availability could be an issue. Uh, we are in the planning stages to build a second observatory this summer. And that one will have probably 18 or so piers. So we can still fit one or two more in. Yeah. So we started about a year and a half, well, about two years ago now, uh, with the idea that we actually started talking about a, uh, a dark sky campground, and that evolved into uh, a remote observatory because that just seemed like a lot less hassle. Uh, but we searched in California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, trying to find that magic combination of a dark sky, utilities, and high-speed internet. And we managed to find what we were beginning to think was maybe a unicorn property uh, about 60 miles north of us uh, in rural Utah. It, we've got 120 acres and it, it did need a little bit of work when we first got the property. Uh, that old single wide had to go obviously, uh, but it did have power, it had a well, and believe it or not, it had uh, fiber optic internet running down this gravel road in the middle of nowhere. And wow. Uh, apparently, the phone company copper wires needed to be replaced, and they found out it was going to be cheaper to replace it with fiber than to replace it with copper. Hmm. So we've got full duplex yep. gigabit and typically run about 900, 950 megabit up and down. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, yeah. What elevation is the site at? Uh, 5150. Okay. Thank you. So it, it is high. We get winter up there, so we do get snow. Uh, you need dew heaters. So the first thing we did was get rid of the old building. Uh, my son is the uh, underground foreman at a electrical contractor here in St. George. And in fact, he was able to borrow the this excavator to get us started tearing it down and loading it into a dumpster. So that all got hauled away in uh, three of the giant roll-off dumpsters. And then we converted where it was into a, a gravel RV parking pad. So we've got, uh, turned out we had a septic system already there that was even permitted by the county uh, and power. So we've got a couple of uh, RV pedestals and uh, sewer hookups and an RV pad. We decided that uh, we should build a prototype in order to you know, kind of test some of our design ideas and the control systems. So we decided we would build a 10 by 12 foot Quonset hut design that housed a single pier, but basically use all the same techniques that we were going to use for the full size building. And the prototype rides on two 24 foot long steel I-beams. So <clears throat> in here, you can see a couple of the RVs parked on that uh, pad. This is one of the rails. So this is my son. Uh, he's, he's the one mixing concrete. I'm the one holding the camera. Uh, but for the prototype, we just set the rail on uh, four by four posts set about three feet in the ground. We had already poured the foundation for the telescope. There's about a yard and a half of concrete below grade and then some rebar and then this 24 inch diameter riser that comes up through the floor of the observatory. In terminology, so that we don't call everything a pier, we call these risers, just to differentiate between this is the riser and then we attach a steel pier on top of it. So you may hear me use those terms. And here in the background, you can see one of the segments of the Quonset hut that's gonna eventually ride on these rails. So this was the, the first rail and getting the first rail in level and pointed east-west was pretty easy getting the second rail in so that it was parallel and square to the first one was even more difficult. Here you can see a couple of C channels and those are on rollers that ride on the uh, I-beam. And then 
basically you loosely assemble each one of these arch segments on the ground and then lift it into position, bolt it down, put the next one together, raise it into position, bolt things together. Uh, this one we raised into position with an excavator. And you just keep doing that over and over. Where, where did and, you find those arch segments? Is that like a archsegment.com website or? Steelmaster.com. Okay. And they seem to be the, for, for some reason, uh, there's a, a couple of other observatories that use the same design. Yeah. And one of the nice things, these you can see how these arches are folded. That gives them a lot of integral support. So the, the building holds itself pretty square. And like this, this should be a time lapse showing us uh, building the floor. 120. There we go. Hey, they're out in the desert, Linwood. I know uh, that it's, area. It's, it's hot out there. It gets hot. And then once we had the floor built, then we had to, uh, we, there's a four foot interior wall that surrounds the, the floor. So when it's, when the building's open, it's still not just open. Uh, there's a four foot wall. So it's about six feet off the ground. That was my wife and I, and then our, our son joined us and things went faster. And then there's a fixed wall on the west end and the building slides off to the east. And if you do that long enough, then you put a you put a back wall on. So this was some kind of crude framing. There's a vertical piece in the center, and then this beam at the back is what gives it support. And there's the finished prototype. Uh, the box here is the opener, and you can see there's an extension from the side that comes out, and then there's a diagonal across to the far side to keep everything square. There's basically a chain that runs from the east end here all the way down to a little extension at the west end. And then this is a gate opener that just pulls the building back and forth. The back wall is attached to the, the building that moves. The front wall is stationary, and then that's the door to get in. So when it's time to open it, you the computer says go. And it opens. The, this is just a, a little diagram. There's um, we used hoist trolleys upside down to capture the building to the C channel. So there's rollers that ride on the C channel, and then there's also the hoist trolley that captures the building to the C channel, so it it can't come off. So with that under our belt, we decided it was time to build the uh, the main observatory. And the design actually has 18 piers on it. And it's same design concept, only it sits on a concrete foundation rather than just wooden posts. And it has an office attached to the stationary wall. This is an aerial view. These um, pineapple slices on the grill are the uh, clearance circles for the telescopes. And this is just a site plan. I said this is about 120 acres. The prototype and the RV pad is up here. The observatory is here. And the caretaker's house where they live is here. Is, so, can you give us a, like, like, where is that? I've been trying to figure out where it is in Utah. Your website doesn't seem to show a location. No, it doesn't. It's, uh, and, and we're a little bit coy about the exact location, but it's in southwest Utah. Uh, north of St. George. Yeah, I was more trying to get a feel for the topography. S Southwest Utah. Yeah, it's it's in a very large um, high valley. There's uh, mountains all around, you know, 360 degrees around. It's actually kind of a terminal valley. Uh, technically, it's in the uh, Great Basin Desert. How is the seeing relative to all the rough terrain around there and wind wind rising? Falling? The mountains are 
20 to 40 miles away. So not, not real close. Like it's, it's a, when I say a big valley, it's a big valley. And the valley itself is flat as a pancake. Uh, we were trying to figure out which direction the land drained. And so we got on the, the road on the east side and drove about 10 miles north. And eventually the elevation dropped by about 10 feet. So that's how we figured out that it drains to the north. Seeing uh, runs in the two to three arc seconds. Oh, okay. You have like good and bad times of the year? Is it, it ever get down? Not that I've really noticed. Um, on a, a good nights, we'll dip down below two. Um, bad nights will be closer to three. And other than that, I haven't really noticed. We had a, a couple weeks in November, December where we were above three. But other than that, I haven't really noticed that much in the way of seasonal fluctuation. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We had our official groundbreaking April 30th. The first thing we did was put in all of the, uh, the foundations for the telescopes. Uh, if you do construction, it's kind of an interesting problem, construction problem, that you have to put in all of these foundations first and then build a building around them and hope that you put all the foundations in the right place so that the building, everything lines up when you're done. Uh, for instance, these are 24-inch diameter risers, and with 16-inch spacing on the floor joists, you have the potential for having to split two joists to go around one foundation. And that complicates the structural design. So the piers were laid out, spaced so that we would never have to split more than one joist. And we would never have to sister a joist, if, if that makes sense to you. So once we had all of the, the foundations in, we, basically we would dig a hole, have a cement truck come out and fill as many holes as he could, typically around five or six out of a, an eight yard or nine yard cement truck. And then we would start filling the uh, sauna tubes, and you can see these stick up about three feet or so um, to account for a crawl space. Once all that was done, then we had to dig out for the uh, footings for the stem wall, which is a concrete wall that goes all the way around the foundation of the um, observatory and then also for the office. And then this channel down the middle is for a pony wall to help support the floor. So had to dig all that out and uh, do what's called over-Xing or over-excavating. Basically, you dig a foot below the grade you want, and then with water and dirt, you pack it back in and pack it down with a jumping jack. Uh, and then the soils engineers have to actually come out and do a compaction test before we can put in our foundation. So we did all that started, had a contractor come out and, and do the concrete for us. And here you can see the, the risers in the background. This is the foundation for the office. There we're starting to put the, uh, the stem wall forms in for the foundation for the observatory. Once that was poured, then we were able to backfill and start bringing the grade up to the, the side of the stem wall. And again, this is office and this is observatory. And you can see these stick up about three feet above the height of the uh, top of the stem wall. And that's to accommodate a crawl space underneath the floor. This is my son-in-law, who is, a, uh, among other things, a fabricator and certified welder. He takes care of you know, pretty much all of the steel fabrication. He had all the tools and and skills to put in the rails and make sure everything was aligned and square and true. Um, so he got that all put in. Here we are putting one of the C channels with rollers onto the I beam. You'll notice this is a little bit bigger I beam than what we had on the prototype. And the extension is sitting on uh, concrete foundations rather than wooden posts. Here's a C channel at the other end of the building, getting ready for the uh, wooden framing. Once the floor framing was started, we came back and ran all the uh, power and ethernet cables from the office out to each one of the piers in the uh, observatory. 
So that's all hardwired. And then we started getting ready to actually put up the steel building. And interesting, this whole building, uh, 25 by 44, came on one pallet. Mm -hmm. It was a heavy pallet, but it was one pallet. So basically what you do then is you assemble one, put it up, and then assemble the next one, put it up, just like we did on the little one. Uh, here, rather than using the uh, excavator, which didn't have enough reach, and there's other issues using a uh, strap to lift it into position, uh, we built this cradle so that we would partially assemble the arch on the ground and then use the skid steer to lift it into position. Again, our son was able to borrow a bucket truck to uh, reach the bolts up at the top. And we got to where with uh, myself, my wife, son, son-in-law, daughter, and their th three or four sons, uh, we were able to put up an arch about every 20 minutes once we really got rolling. Hmm. So you just keep doing that over and over, uh, in our case, 22 times for a 44 foot long building. This was a view from the bucket truck. Here you can see the, uh, how the, the risers come up about an inch and a half above the floor. Close up of the uh, opener system and it's getting it well secured so that it, there's no wiggle uh, on one of these uh, concrete columns was a challenge that my son-in-law had to do a fair amount of additional reinforcing. This box comes from the manufacturer and it just by itself is a little too wobbly. A little bit more uh, extensive framing on the back wall. And this is myself and my son-in-law putting the uh, sheet metal up on the back wall to enclose that. Son and son-in-law uh, running the wires inside. Uh, here's the electrical panel and then all of the ethernet cabling all comes up in the office as well. And then you can see the door out to the telescope floor. You can't believe how many tubes of caulk uh, we went through. <laughs> this, is, this is this is my daughter, and she was the uh, she was the queen of all of the uh, the caulking. Uh, the The finished surfaces are mostly just OSB with the seams caulked and then painted. So there was a lot of caulking. This is an aerial view showing the here's the observatory. Uh, we've got a shop building over here. Uh, this is where we, for instance, fabricate piers or uh, roller assemblies, and then this is the caretaker's house back here. So when it's all done, that's what it looks like. Somebody asked about the generator. This is the generator. So we've got the climate controlled office attached on the uh, west end. The building opens to the east and it actually opens about 10 feet beyond fully open uh, to try to give us as as much of a viewing angle to the east as we can get. And then the reason is oriented east and west is to preserve the north and south horizons. And you, you can see there's really, it's just flat. So if you can see over the wall, uh, there's nothing in your way. What, we're in Florida, a lot of us, most of us on next call. So we're particularly cognizant of storms. What, what risks do you have out there of, of like serious wind storms that might destroy that. Is, is there any real risk? Um, there is that we had, uh, I guess a couple of months ago, we had a wind storm come through with gusts to 60 miles an hour, maybe more than that. Um, the, the gusts were high enough that our weather system wasn't reading them. Um, but everything stayed together, so no problems. Our weather pattern, I grew up, we lived in Illinois up until a few years ago, so I'm kind of familiar with that weather pattern of summer humidity and storms that blow up in the middle of the night. That's really rare here. If it's going to rain, generally you see it coming for a couple of days. And the it's, it's very rare for the weather to change at night unexpectedly. Yeah, I was thinking more of not 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 like nighttime stuff, but you know, a serious 
I guess you, you can't get hurricanes where you are. Do you get tornadoes there? Uh, we can get tornadoes, but they're rare and, and, and very small. Uh, and, and typically when we have them, there's, there will be a debate whether it was a tornado or a dust devil that does they wind up kind of looking the same and they're very long and ropey. So, but yeah, we do, our typical weather pattern most of the year is windy in the afternoon and then the wind dies down at sunset. It's so tempting with to do something like this with our light polluted skies. But, although we do yeah, have we do have good seeing. Florida. We do we do have good seeing in Florida. I've heard that that uh, there's nothing in the way. Well, there's I was going to say that the problem is that really good seeing that's um, covered with light pollution and clouds doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> so there's pluses and minuses. Yes. You get a good view of the H2O nebula. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I'm going to go get some cloud pictures and run them through Blur Exterminator and see what I get. <laughs> it, won't, it won't work. <laughs> I'm gonna, Alan. You'll you'll see behind me one night a, a new picture that I'll call the that I've discovered a new nebula. <laughs> so, I'm any sorry. other questions about the uh, the observatory or the process? Anybody have any questions from here? Oh, let's see some pictures. Oh, okay. That's the, uh, that was my, my first APOD. That's obviously the Veil Nebula in a uh, SHO palette. And I made the bold decision to just let the green shine. <laughs> I think that was in uh, June. And then more recently, this is the- uh, oh, You just got another one. Yep, yeah, this was the uh, tadpoles. And, and they actually used both a star and starless version. To be honest, I don't know that I'm completely happy with this color palette. The nice thing about the color palette, though, it's a it's kind of an, an SHO color palette, but it has a lot of color depth in the different gases. And in most of my other renderings, all of this sulfur gets lost, and it really shows up in this color palette. So you can really see all of the different gases. So I, I guess from that perspective, I like it. And Craig, how many hours um, would you say is in uh, of imaging is in that? Uh, six or eight, maybe. Oh wow! But yeah, okay, just so rub it in. It takes a lot. Yeah, if I I think this was probably two nights. Um, yeah, I get I get bored quickly, so generally, you know, generally after two nights, I'm ready to move on to something else. Sometimes I'll do a third little... night if I feel like I need to. Linwood just did the tadpoles, but I don't think it was that that tight end, was it, Linwood? It was thirty some hours. I've forgotten now. Uh, it was not the field of view was not too different. I just needed a whole lot longer to get it. Yeah, and with uh, with dark skies, that it, you, it's amazing how much difference that makes. And I'm I'm real happy I've got uh, the ASI sixty two hundred cameras. Uh, a color and a monochrome that I can swap back and forth. And, you know, those things are just beasts. They do a great job. And you're in Bortle 2, is that right? Technically, it's a Bortle 2. Uh, we get readings anywhere in the 3 to 1 range. Our best reading was 22.03, which is well into the Bortle 1. Wow. But most nights were probably in the 2 to 3 range. It's amazing how much it varies from night to night. Yeah, we get that too. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little more recent with the uh, M82, with the uh, RG, RGB plus some um, HA, M81, because you can't do one without the other. And then this was just an exercise in uh, trying to see if I how much of the IFN I could get. And to be real honest, I toned down the IFN in this version that 
I always wind up struggling with how much do I want the IFN to show and how much do I want the galaxies to show. And if you're not careful, to, to me, they wind up competing and you lose your the subject of your image. So I like to choose I, one or the other and then minimize the the one that's not the star of the image. Yeah, I really like it like that. Yeah, thank you. Let's see, what was that? The uh, tadpoles and flaming star. That's just you know part of one night with a uh, color camera and a L enhance filter. And typically, what I'll do is I, I've got a filter wheel on the color camera, so I switch between an L enhance and just a, a clear filter. So I'm using you know the clear RGB for the stars and the L enhance for the bulk of the nebula. Close up of the, uh, this is the one I was talking about that was the building just opened for a couple hours and then closed. And that's putting it in perspective in the, the broader Seagull Nebula. Starless image of the uh, Horsehead region. I, I just love the, the structure of the gas. Here in, went dust crazy with the uh, the iris nebula and I'm not sure if this is technically considered IFN or just dust M33 uh, RGB close-up of the center of the rosette nebula and then an SHO version Close up of the flaming star. This is I. Back, back, this, back up for a second. How how long uh, how long uh, Im imaging on something like this? Again, this was probably um, two nights. So wow, eight or ten hours, something like that. This is a project I've been working on since early December, and I think I just finished it up. Yeah, I. Yeah. I get by with uh, a lot of little data, I guess I would say. I think this is a, a HSO color palette plus uh, some of this reflection nebula it doesn't show up in narrow band, so I had to bring it back from RGB. Also remember he's uh, looking through less atmosphere at 5100. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, agreed. An almost starless image of the Pleiades. I don't think I've ever seen anyone do that. That's kind of cool, though. No, I haven't either. No. And then with more, this is still with most of the stars taken out, but uh, semi starless. Fish head, this is you know part of the Heart Nebula. This is a segment of the North American Nebula. That a lot of times I enjoy taking the uh, the longer focal length and just picking out little vignettes of the larger nebulae. Running Man and Orion. I think this is a uh, three panel mosaic. Close up of Andromeda. And then this puts that close up in perspective. Yeah. So that. That's about the uh, field of view difference between the uh, the Takahashi, which is the wide field, and then the uh, plane wave 12 and a half, which is the close up. The Sombrero Galaxy. Lunar Eclipse. I think that was, was that last year or earlier this year? Sometime recently. California Nebula. And a close up of the California Nebula. This is, <laughs> I, I think, this is a like a 12 panel mosaic of the uh, witch head. And I, again, I made kind of the bold decision to remove all but the uh, the one star. Was that was that Rigel? Um, Rigel, yeah. So I left that in just to, uh, as as they say, to motivate the light on the. Uh, which had itself. 
And then more recently, I went back and just grabbed a little bit of uh, RGB data one night. So this is, you know, kind of part of one night of the witch head in RGB. Plus, again, I use the, the L enhance to pick up some of the hydrogen. Lacerda Nebula, again, a mixture of uh, L enhance and RGB. Close up of a portion of the soul. And close up of a different portion of the soul. So if you put those in perspective, there's where, where they are on the larger nebula. Triptych of the Orion without Orion itself, with the, the flame, corset, and running man. A wide panorama, including M78 and the horse head. Just always amazes me how much hydrogen there is floating around out there. There's a lot up there in that area. Yeah, just, just mind numbing. Another wide field of Orion. I'm kind of I'm kind of obsessed with Orion. I will admit that. And just playing around, there's uh, help the a starless Hubble palette of Orion, where I again I let the uh, let the hydrogen really be green. As Kermit says, it's not easy being green. <laughs> the elephant trunk. This is in the uh, uh, Hubble SHO color palette. And then turning that around, this is OHS Ooh, color like palette. That. A little different. Yeah. O OHS? Yeah. Basically, just reverse the sulfur and the oxygen. So oxygen is red and sulfur is blue. Tadpoles and flaming star. And I guess that's a, an SHO color palette. Uh, 2017 K2 comet. And this was one that uh, it was moving fast enough. I had to image the comet uh, guiding on the comet and then image the background guiding on the stars and produce a starless image of the comet and then put it back in with the uh, stacked image of the stars. So it, it, it took more processing to put this back together to get a sharp picture of both the comet and the stars. Crescent Nebula. Crab Nebula. Dolphin. Dolphin. That was, can't remember if that's, that's either one part of one night or part or two nights combined. I think it might be just one night um, with the L enhance filter and then using RGB for the stars. Thor's helmet. And that is two nights of data. This is the comet that's up and about now. Uh, this circle for reference is about the size of the moon. So very diffuse wide tail here and then a very distinct tail going up here. You know how bright that was when you took it? Roughly? Nine or 10th magnitude, I believe. And I believe, if I recall correctly, this was like five 30 second frames. It was, it it's was all quick. Not, it's still not naked eye at all. No. Hopefully it'll get there. M78 close up. Double cluster. And there's surprisingly a lot of hydrogen in the background. The heart of the uh, heart nebula. Starless jellyfish in the, uh, this is also in uh, OHS, I believe. So inverted from the SHO. Soul Nebula. Uh, oh, 
this is interesting talking about the effect that stars have on our perception so this is the star field and that's with the stars minimized wow so if you look close you can see that it's there yeah but star management has such a huge effect on uh, in post-processing so I'm a, I'm a big user of star exterminator and I really like the way blur exterminator uh, gives me another tool to tackle stars and I I frequently if if I have large looking stars or a lot of stars I will turn the uh the stellar factor up to uh, 35 or even 40 percent from its default of 25. Christmas tree cluster you can kind of kind of make out the Christmas tree here another tadpoles and flaming star just a moon picture C composite with some stars behind it uh, there's there's one where I decided to let the IFN be the star that if I recall this background image of the IFN uh, there was a period of like a month where at the end of every sequence each night I just had the telescope finish out the night on the M81 M82 area with a uh, just a simple uh, luminance filter so it was shooting monochrome uh, luminance frames and wound up with like 90 subs 90 10 minute subs of this and for me that's a lot we were just talking about that uh in in our uh, uh an email exchange about uh, the difference between a five minute sub and a, a 10 minute sub and and uh, uh somebody had mentioned the signal to noise problem with longer exposures what do you what do you find uh uh is a, is a 10 minute sub worthy worthy the, the extra uh, baggage you get with it the what I've kind of settled into is I use 10 minute subs for narrow band and the L enhance filter. And I use either five minute or sometimes three minute, or I'm sorry, either five minute or two minute for RGB. And the, right, okay. the luminance I usually do five minute. And I, I've just kind of fallen into that pattern by default. And that's what I always use the I probably use two minute subs with RGB mostly because I'm trying to get uh, stars and star color oh, right yeah a lot of times I'll get enough detail that I can still pull out an RGB image but typically I'll have you know maybe six each of red green and blue and somewhere in the 10 to 15 each of uh, narrow band it's kind of a, a comfortable place for me so if we wanted to you said that a couple of your your otas were available for lease or or you know rent for a night or, or whatever how does that work and how much does that normally run it depends on the target and the amount of data that you want um the the price is $70 for the first imaging hour, 50 for the second, and then 40 for all additional. And that's just imaging time. So an hour, for instance, would be six 10 minute subs. Uh, and then you get all the calibration data along with that. Uh, basically, we start with a Zoom meeting where we talk about the, the target, uh, look at a, a virtual planetarium to set the framing, uh, talk about sequence times and filters and how much data you want. And so by the end of that Zoom meeting, we have a uh, an imaging plan and a price. And if you want to proceed, then we'll send you an invoice for the price and slot you in for a good time to capture the data. Right. And the way I do it, the that data belongs to you. Uh, that I don't do anything with it. I, well, I shouldn't say I don't do anything with it. I do process it just to make sure it's good data. But other than that, unless you give me permission to use it, I don't use it for anything and I don't share it with anyone else. So it's your data. Okay. 
and usually I will live stream those sessions so that you can either live or go on YouTube later and, and watch it run. Um, <clears throat> it's it's actually not as exciting as it sounds, as you probably know. It's I, I like to say it's for people who find watching paint dry to be a bit too hectic. <laughs> you, know, you sit there for 10 minutes, a sub pops up, oh wow, and then you sit there for another 10 minutes. Yeah. 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 Every now and then There's you get excited. There, there's a group of us that actually does uh, a fair amount of sleeping through our our, our sequences, our sessions. Um, we just set them up and let them run. Yep. Go out and get go out and get the scope in the morning. Yep. Yeah. That's when I was doing it in my backyard. That's what I would do. Uh, you know, there for a while I had to set an alarm to get up to do a meridian flip, and then gradually you know through the asi air got to where i could trust it to do the flip and then when we decided yeah. to go into the observatory business i figured i better figure out how to do true remote, true remote. all um, right well very good any other questions craig do you have anything else no that's kind of the end of it okay unless you have some questions any any other questions for craig uh, I don't have any from here. Sure. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you. It was fascinating. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. If you, if you do fun. have any questions, you can find me through our uh, website at uh, utahdesertremote.com, uh, or you can probably find me on Facebook.